Um, but let's get back to uh, the math. Oh no, before we go into the math, um, so this is the last lecture and it, it won't take the full block. And after this lecture we do have uh, enough time to hopefully answer all your questions and do exercises. So we can immediately after this lecture uh, start with exercises and questions and um, then next week and the week after next week uh, we have four blocks left. Um, and so I would suggest at least one block we should have again over in the lab uh, such that uh, you can show us your results on the computer and ask questions there. How about having next Monday such a session uh, in the Linux lab? Would that be okay? Yeah? Okay, and also, um, so I looked yesterday, but we don't have the exact date for the examination. But it definitely will be in the last week of the Prüfungszeitraum. Um, so, the question is whether you would like to have another uh, question session uh, right before the exam, like one week before the exam or a few days, yeah? yeah? So then in this case I would cancel one of the blocks in the next two weeks and have uh, another block uh, some days before the examination. Yeah? Uh, so which, which block should we cancel? Shall it be the last or whatever? Do you want to have more time to prepare your questions so then we could maybe skip next Monday? Yeah? So that means we have the, the session in the lab next Wednesday. Okay? Yeah, fine. And next Monday there is no lecture, no exercises. Okay? Good. Ah, yeah. Okay. Good. Oh, and um, so I will not be here on Monday, June 25, but we may offer an exercises session anyway. Or we could, uh, we could actually also skip this, uh, um, this block. What would you prefer? I would say we skip next Monday and then uh, we meet on Wednesday and on June 25 um, Richard and, and Elias would offer they are here and if you want to come you come and if not. So. Okay, yes. Last one last question. Um, the Mark 1 or the repeating exam, would it, will it be on the same Yes, it will be at the same date, same location, everything the same, yeah. Same time? Oh, you want to, to do both? Yeah. Aha, uh -huh. so then we need to have uh, two different dates. Oh yes, that's, that's right, uh, we can't do it at the same time. Huh? Okay, yes, uh, so I will talk to Mr. Reiser about this. Um, yeah, it's good that you ask because they did not schedule uh, this. Huh? <laughs> that would be that would be a real challenge. I mean, it's not impossible because I prepare the exams in a way such that I can solve them in something between one-third and one-half of the time. Huh? <laughs> but... <laughs> okay. And you also have to register for, for this um, repetition of math one. So is this possible? Did you try to? Um, I think they, they did it automatically. 
automatically, you only have to cancel it if you don't override it, I think. So you are automatically registered, uh -huh. all those who failed the, the last exam or what? So for, for me it was the case that we had Aha, okay, okay. So then this problem is actually solved. But then maybe, maybe Mr. Reiser automatically schedules uh, this exam, but we, I, I, I will look at it. Okay, yes, so we are in the middle of solving linear, we have been in the middle of solving linear differential equations. Now let's look at such a linear differential equation. This is an example. So, actually not uh, equations, but systems of equations. Maybe this is not sharp enough. No, that's a zoom. Ah, yeah, okay. So we were talking about systems of coupled linear differential equations of first order. Um, and such a system, the, the, on the left hand side we just have the derivatives, on the right hand side we have a matrix times the vector. Um, and this obviously is linear. And now what we started looking last time was um, a system which is a somewhat nonlinear, but not too nonlinear. We added um, um, we added a term um, with mixed powers, sorry, of um, of first and second order of the variables. Huh? So we have here first order in, in y1 and second order in, in both variables and here the other way around. Um, and this is to show what may happen in nonlinear differential equations. Because here the world is no longer so clean and simple as it is in linear. I mean, we, we actually saw all the behavior that, that may occur in linear systems. We may have constant solutions, oscillations, exponential growth or decay, and of course a combination of all of them. Uh, um, but now other effects may occur. So, excuse me, are there any questions? Okay, so and if not, please uh, remain quiet. What you see here is nothing new. Huh? We have an oscillation with an exponential decay. Um, yes. And, um, and this is for alpha equal minus 0.1. Yeah. And now if we change alpha, we may get interesting different behavior. For alpha equal 0.2 for this system, we get, so we start with this initial condition, uh, y1 and y2 equals zero. Um, or, oh, I, actually I don't know, was it? No, it was not, it's not exactly zero. If you start with exactly zero, then there is a constant solution zero. Huh? But if you start with, an, um, um, with small values which are non-zero, then you get uh, for alpha equal 0.2, you get this behavior. So in the beginning it looks like an exponential growth, but then uh, it's limited. It's limited, it goes up to a certain limit, and uh, that's it. And now if we look at our phase diagram, again, here we have y1 and here we have y2 plotted, so you see 
this kind of exponential growth in the beginning which gives us such a, a, a spiral and now we have such a, a limiting cycle. Yeah? So then it ends in this limiting cycle and stays in this cycle. Um, yes, okay. And now we look at the same setting, same alpha, point 2, but different initial values. Different initial values means now we use uh, quite large initial values and then you see we still have the oscillations but a decay of the amplitude and then uh, a convergence of the amplitude to some value and here again it ends in the same limit circle. Huh? Um, and um, so what we see here is that um, in contrast to the linear system, for the linear system if it is stable, we talked about stability, stable, a linear system is stable if, uh, if the real part of the eigenvalues of the matrix is negative. Uh, if we have negative real part because this leads to an exponential with a negative power and then of course we have an exponential decay and uh, the solutions converge to zero. Uh, so we do have one uh, unique fixed point. Uh, we do have one unique limit. Uh, so it converges to zero and now what happens here it converges to such a limiting circle. Uh, this is a new behavior that we do not observe in linear systems. Um, and maybe this is not too surprising, uh, but now we look... Uh, oh yeah, sorry, before we go to the next example, let's, uh, let's uh, summarize the results. So we, we have such a limit, so, uh, limit cycle, which we also call a stable attractor. Yeah? It's, I mean it's called an attract attractor because it attracts the behavior no matter from where I start. If I start here we end up in this uh, uh, limit cycle. If we start inside we also end up in this limit cycle. Um, yes, and we call it a stable attractor. Why is it stable? We will in a few minutes see an unstable attractor and then you know what, it, what that means. Huh? And this is also called a supercritical Hopf bifurcation. Huh? Um, it's a bifurcation because, I mean, if you look at the dependence of the results depending on the parameter alpha, we may have this behavior or that behavior. So the behavior circling out from the initial value to the limit cycle or circling inwards to the limit cycle. Um, okay, yes, and for alpha, uh, for negative alpha, yeah, maybe we should go back. For negative alpha, we have the the well-known old behavior. Huh? So for negative alpha we don't have a limiting cycle, we just have a limit, a stable uh, a limit point. Okay, and for, <coughs> for alpha greater than or equal to zero we have unstable dynamics. Unstable means that there is not one unique limit point. Huh? It's a limit cycle. Huh? So the, the solution is not stable uh, for t towards infinity, it cycles. Okay, and the, uh, the mathematical analysis um, is based on the so-called Lyapunov coefficients. And these Lyapunov coefficients are actually... Yeah, I show you on the next slide what a Lyapunov coefficient is. Yeah? 
Um, okay, and here um, a definition of this term of Hopf bifurcation. The appearance or disappearance of a periodic orbit through a local change in the stability properties of a steady point is known as Hopf bifurcation. Huh? Appearance or disappearance of a periodic orbit. Huh? That's what we have seen. And we have seen for negative alpha, we have one limit point and as soon as alpha is zero or greater than zero, then we get such a uh, periodic orbit. Yeah? And that's what's called a Hopf bifurcation. If I remember right, Mr. Lehmann has done his master thesis on mathematical analysis of Hopf bifurcations, but you can ask him. Um, okay, and now we look at this system and the difference is before we had a minus sign here and now we have a plus sign here. Yeah? And we could even more generalize this system in, I mean we could add here another parameter beta and also here beta. And this, be this parameter beta, that's what is called the Lyapunov coefficient. Yeah? So the Lyapunov coefficient determines whether these terms here appear with positive or negative sign and uh, with a certain value. Yeah? But what's really critical is whether this Lyapunov coefficient is positive or negative because this determines the behavior. And I mean what I did, I made it a little bit simpler. I first used the example with a Lyapunov coefficient equal to minus one and now we have it with plus one. Yeah? And uh, we will now see the behavior, uh, what happens. And uh, at the first glance these um, pictures look quite similar. We again have such a limit cycle. We have such a uh, kind of exponential spiral. But if you look at this picture, it is different. I mean, this is like a mirror image mirrored at this line. What we had before, we started like that and it increases. But now, we start with the high amplitude and it's, uh, we have a spiral going inwards to this limit point. Huh? So the behavior is like we start in this circle and then after a certain time and it really depends on your initial conditions. On the initial conditions and on alpha. So it may happen that it goes in the cycle 100 times and then suddenly it starts spiraling inward. And that's really interesting. Here, please look at the initial values. 0 and 0.447. So x equals 0 0.447. Yeah, that's such a point where I started it. Huh? And now if I make a really tiny change of this starting value, I just replace the 7 here by an 8. We can't see the difference here in the picture then we get this behavior. This is still, still we do have this, this limit, this cycle here. And, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, that was of course wrong. I started at this point, sorry. I mean this would be minus 0.447. We started at this point. Um, and now we started at this point here. So it's a, a tiny little bit more outside. Maybe I should have 
not taken 0.448, but 0.4473 uh, something. Uh. Now what happens, in the beginning I stay on this uh, circle and then it spirals out. And you could, you could really use the starting points even closer together and then you would have 100 rounds on the circle and then it goes out or it goes inward depending on some little noise or round off error or whatever. Uh. So this is really by chance. If you start exactly on this circle, then you don't know whether it goes in or out. Huh? So this is a first uh, little look at chaotic behavior. Huh? Chaotic behavior means that we cannot decide how our dynamical system behaves. It just depends on really tiny random effects. And of course it's a dramatic difference. I mean of course it's a dramatic difference whether it converges to the origin or whether it diverges like that. And these are effects that we can observe in, in any nonlinear dynamical system. And of course such effects we can observe them all the time. We just have to look at the weather. Huh? The, these, these chaotic dynamics, that's the reason why still even with huge powerful computers weather forecast is not perfect. Most of the time weather forecast is very good even uh, for four days in the future. Most of the time we have very good weather forecast even for four days in the future. And why is this? Because what these guys do is solving differential equations. These huge computers do nothing but solving differential equations. I mean it's partial differential equations so we have not only uh, derivatives with respect to one variable but with respect to uh, three or four variables, there are actually four variables, it's with respect to the, the uh, to x, I mean we have three dimensions here in the atmosphere um, and the time, so we have four dimensions, four partial derivatives and uh, they have to solve these partial differential equations. And what they put, uh, do is they put a grid over the whole atmosphere. So if it's the weather forecast for Europe, then they put a, a two-dimensional grid over all of Europe. And actually it's a three-dimensional because the, there is a height in the atmosphere. And of course uh, the, the smaller the step size of this grid, the better is the forecast for Weingarten. I mean, if Weingarten is in between uh, two points where one is in Paris and the other is in Munich, then there is no good forecast for Weingarten. But if there is a grid point for Weingarten, then it's better, of course. Huh? Uh, otherwise, Weingarten is just the average between Munich and Paris or something like that. Huh? Um, yes, and now, now here we can explain why normally weather forecast is very good but sometimes they have no chance and they will completely fail. Look, if our initial value is here and we solve the differential equation then it's no problem to make a forecast for four days in the future which would be here. And if the initial condition is um, like here, then it's trivial. Then they would say it's sunny for all future because it would converge here into the sun. Huh? But if the initial conditions are somewhere here on this circle, they can't tell you whether it's sunny or whether you have a, th a thunderstorm. No chance to decide. Huh? And these systems are even more chaotic than what we have here and I will show you I will show you an example which is much closer to our weather forecast scenario. 
Okay, yeah. So what did we have here? We have a limit cycle as an unstable attractor. That's how they call it. Why is it an unstable attractor? I mean, don't ask me why it's called an attractor, because it does not attract the solutions, it actually deflects the solutions. Yeah? But the term unstable is plausible, because if we start on this uh, circle, for a certain time we may stay on the circle, but at some point it will leave the circle because it is unstable and we cannot determine in which direction we will leave the circle. Okay, so it's an unstable attractor. It's also called a subcritical Hopf bifurcation. So before it was a supercritical, now it's called a subcritical. Um, and again, um, again the results depend on alpha. For alpha negative, still the origin is a stable steady point. Let's go back. Look, what... Um, Uh, let me see. Yeah, we, yeah we, we do have a negative alpha here because if we start inside here, it converges to the origin. Yeah. Okay, and for alpha greater than or equal to zero, we have unstable dynamics, uh, which means divergence. Yes. Um, and the first Lyapunov coefficient is positive. That's what I said already. Okay. Yeah, and now let's look at another example, the Lorentz attractor. And this is a really very, very, very simple model of such um, of dynamic uh, processes in the atmosphere of uh, the um, convection, air convection in the atmosphere. So we have now three variables, x, y and z, which are the uh, three dimensions of the, the space in the atmosphere and the time. Huh? And don't ask me what, what, what these equations mean, I have no idea. Huh? Um, I just know that this is supposed to be a simple model of such convection behavior. And now let's look at solutions. Yeah? This is it's the so-called Lorentz attractor. It's a very popular example of such a chaotic um, system of differential equations. Um, and uh, it's even worse than what we had before. Look, what we had before was there is this <coughs> unstable attractor and it depending on the initial condition this may happen or this may happen but this attractor is one well-defined one-dimensional circle but here the attractor is chaotic and this means um, as you can see, I mean, there, there are such circles, but many of them. So we may be on this circle, or on this circle, or on this outer circle. And now, and nobody can tell what happens. So it may happen that I am on this circle, and I travel around 15 times, and at some point it may happen that I change into this outer circle and then I am here um, 75 times and at some point I switch to the outer circle again and nobody can determine when you decide to switch to the outer circle huh? so the behavior is, uh, it can be visualized in this picture, I, t I took both images from Wikipedia where there is a, a nice site about the Lorentz attractor. So let's, um, let's start here. Huh? So we are now in, in this uh, attractor here 
but we decide to move into the other one and now we do a few loops in the other attractor as you can see and here we decide to go back to this one again and we stay here for a certain time and now we decide to go back to this one again and so on yes and I mean I put an exercise for you where I ask you to go on this Wikipedia site and there is a tiny little octave program and you, you look into this octave program um, and you, would, uh, you will be able to learn some things. First you will see how the command for octave is to solve a system of differential equations. So you, if you don't want to use your own runge kutta program, you could just use the octave command, uh, which, which this guy did here. And then it produces you these uh, solution uh, tables of values. And then I would like to ask you to modify this program a little bit such that you can observe one point on such a trajectory and then see whether it uh, stays in one attractor or it uh, switches over to the other attractor. Uh? So this is uh, yeah, this exercise about the Lorentz attractor. Okay, I mean I don't go into mathematics of this. I just show you the results and I mean look this is uh, for, for engineers this is actually the math an engineer should learn. Um, and, and I decided, when I, when I entered this chapter on differential equations, I decided to start with the numerics and not doing the mathematical analysis because that's what the engineer needs. You use a numerical solver and uh, throw your differential equation into the solver and then you get the solutions, hopefully. Um, it may happen that the solutions your numerical solver gives you have nothing to do with the real solution because the numerics is, uh, uh, is not well behaved. Yeah? And then if this happens it really helps you to understand how the numerical algorithm goes and maybe to know a little bit about attractors and stable or unstable behavior and so on. Um, yeah, and I mean what, what we did is we did first the numerics, then we looked at the simplest cases of linear differential equations, got some understanding about stability and now we look at some, I mean this is an outlook into nice toys and examples which we could uh, observe and use and play with them. Okay, and I want to go to even another example of chaotic behavior. Huh? Now we look at a discrete system. What we had here, look, these are continuous systems. We have a continuous dependence of our resulting variables x, y and z depending on the time. But we can of course also look at discrete systems. Actually we, we do have, when we do the numerics of such a differential equation, what do we do in the first place? We make a discretization. We replace these derivatives on the left hand side, um, so uh, x dot for example, x dot um, at time t is x of t plus h minus x of t divided by h. It's not equal, we approximate it like that. Huh? So that's what we do and now you see, I mean this is really um, an infinitesimal uh, quantity, the derivative. And now we go to a finite difference, a finite step size h. And now we have actually a difference equation. Look, this is a difference equation. Uh, so we, we transform the differential equation, which is true only in the limit for h 
towards zero into a, a finite difference equation. And, and now what I on our numerics does is we do an iteration from t to t plus h. That's all we do. So we have a discrete dynamic system. And of course we want to, we, we want to have our step size as small as possible in order to get a realistic simulation of this uh, dynamic system. But now we look at an example where the problem statement already is uh, discrete. Oops. Yeah. It is lo the logistic equation. This is again an example of a population dynamics somewhat related to this lotka volterra uh, dynamics that we looked at. It was the, the sheep and wolves example. We had two populations, one sheep population and a wolf population. And now here we are talking about one population only. So it's even simpler. Huh? Um, yes, uh, so we have a population of some species. Um, and uh, so the count is xn. xn is the number of, uh, of individuals we have in this population. And n is the time. So n evolves, we start with n equals zero and do discrete time steps. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry, there is an, an error here. This uh, should not be here, this QV. Okay, and, so, and now we do have a reproduction rate uh, proportional to this, uh, so proportional to Xn and the factor is QR. Yeah? So with this factor QR we can control whether these uh, individuals do reproduce fast or uh, maybe they even shrink. Uh, it depends on Q. And then uh, we also have an, a rate how these animals or individuals, how they die. How many of them would die? And this uh, rate is proportional to C minus Xn. Uh, um, and C, this C is the capacity of the world, of the habitat where these uh, individuals live. Yeah? So that's the, the maximum amount of individuals uh, that can live in, in this finite world. Yeah? And uh, look, um, I mean, how is it? If xn is equal to c, then we would have such a dying rate which is zero. <coughs> is this plausible? Oh yes, of course. I mean, um, that's not the number of individuals that die. It actually gives us the number of individuals in the next time step. Yeah? Um, and if xn is equal to c, then it's, it's, it's actually too much. Yeah? And so it goes to zero if xn goes to the limit. I mean, that's what we currently have on this planet. Huh? We have too many people consuming too much energy and too many resources and so on. And it will maybe finally go to zero if we uh, uh, don't try to save the planet. I mean, this is a very simple model. Huh? It does not describe this extremely complex planet here. Huh? Um, okay, and now this is our um, logistic equation. Huh? So we multiply the reproduction rate and the dying rate 
together and that's what we get, yes. Oh, and here it should of course be Q, Q, D, sorry. And now this is uh, the new population at time step n plus 1. Yeah, okay, and now, I mean, here we have three parameters, C, QR, and QD, and now we simplify the whole thing. Um, we replace C by 1, because it doesn't matter. So now we know the maximum population is 1. Huh? And uh, these two parameters, because they are multiplied, we can melt them together to one uh, number. And now that's the logistic equation. So we, we replace these two by R and this by one. And now this is the logistic equation. Yes. Um, maybe we should look at the graph of this right-hand side. Um, it is, so here we have 1, uh, here we have 0.5, and the graph is symmetrical. So it's symmetric to this line 0.5, it has a maximum here at 0.5, so this means um, that the population at the next step um, is maximized if the, uh, so if, if xn is 0.5. If it gets to the limit, then uh, reproduction is quite small, and if it goes to zero, then two. And I mean, it's really simple, isn't it? It's oh, as simple as it can be. A very simple dynamic equation. And now what you can do is play around with it. That's what I did. I mean, I like playing around with formulas and numbers. That's really fun. I did it. And I got these columns. So for different R, uh, if we take r equal 2.2, then we get um, this sequence of numbers. And as you can see here, it converges to some limit which is close to this number, 0.545. Now if we if we do the same thing, uh, and yeah, so I took r equal 2.2 and an initial value of 0.1, and we get this uh, sequence. Now we take r equal 3.2 and start with 0.1, and now let's look at the sequence here. Um, and what we can see is kind of an oscillating behavior. Here we have 0.75, then 0 0.597, 0 0.7, 0 0.56, and so on. And this looks like um, it looks like we get two limit points. And finally, the solution oscillates between these two limit points back and forth. So here we have one limit, here we suddenly get two limits, and now if we look at this sequence here, we get four limits. So 0 0.5008, this one, this one, and that one. So look, uh, if we go four steps back, we had this again. Then here we have this repeated, this repeated, and this repeated. And the interesting observation here is, again, similar to what we had before, 
um, in, in this Lyapunov example, depending on the parameter R, here we have one solution, uh, not solution, one limit point, two limit points, four limit points, and if you increase R even further, we get eight limit points, 16, 32, and so on. Huh? So, um, and look, what we, have, what we have here is actually in the limit we get a periodic behavior. It us, uh, the, period, the period length here is two, here it's one, here it's four, then the period is 16, 32, so we get a so-called period doubling. Yeah? Um, at certain points, values of the parameters, we suddenly get a doubling of the period. Um, and that can be shown in this diagram. In this diagram, we have the parameter R here, so starting at 2.4 up to 4.0. And here we have our solution values. So what we, what we did before was, actually, we took one certain R. What did we have? What was the first R? Oh, 2.2. And the second was 3.2. 2.2 it was actually here. So we get one solution which it was 0.5 for something. So that was somewhere here. Yeah? And now the second was, what was it? 3.2. That was here. And we, we observed these two solutions. That's what we saw. So what, we, what is drawn here is of course only these limit points. Yeah? The two limit points we get. And now if we take 3.5, that's what we had, you see we have four limit points. And now if at this point, which is 3.5 something, the, the behavior switches to eight limit points. And then you may observe it here, it switches to, it doubles again to 16 limit points and so on. And on the next picture, <coughs> we see an enlargement of the whole thing. So, you, I mean, here at this point, we have already eight limit points. Here we have 16, here we have 32, and then 64, and then at some point, it becomes really chaotic. Yeah? And, uh, yeah, and I mean, isn't this fascinating? This elegance, it's, I mean, isn't it beautiful? Look at these curves and this, I mean, the shading, the darkness represents the density of limit points. Huh? So any point in this diagram is a limit point. And at, uh, if, you, if we look here, then um, we probably may have infinitely many limit points. But if you look here, that's quite interesting. So here we have, it looks like we have three limit points, yes. And now, if you look at this here, we have one limit point here. Then we have the period doubling, and again doubling, again doubling. So if you look, if, if you would enlarge the image like that, if you zoom in here, then this looks the same as the whole image. And that's what we call a fractal behavior. Huh? So this is a typical, really, a fractal, fractal object. And such fractal objects, they appear from nonlinear dynamic systems. They may appear. They don't need to appear necessarily, but they may appear. And, I mean, why do we like this picture. Why does it look good or aesthetic to us? Because it is kind of similar to what we observe in nature. Maybe flowers may look like that, or plants or trees, whatever. That's why we like to see this. And I mean, 
Why is this uh, resembles this to nature? Because we do have such nonlinear dynamic processes in nature too. So that's kind of a simple, very simple modeling of behaviors in nature. Yes, and this is actually the last slide for this semester. And uh, maybe it's a, a beautiful slide, maybe even more beautiful than sometimes the lecture was. <laughs> but uh, it is as beautiful as mathematics can be. Yeah? And you will discover this beauty of mathematics only if you dive into this, should we call it nature? No, in this, into this artificial world. I mean, math mathematics is the world in our brain. Yeah? Uh, it's really a world in our brain. And uh, I mean, you can see this image without understanding anything of mathematics. But understanding this image is possible only if you know what's behind. And I mean, understanding, for example, means really knowing why do we have the period doubling? What happens here? And why do we have the doubling all the time? And this, of course, means now going back and looking, yeah, looking into this formula. And it's such a simple formula. Extremely simple formula. formula. And this extremely simple formula produces such a beautiful behavior. But that's what we observe sometimes in nature too. There is such a really tiny little seed and you drop it on the ground and there comes some, some soil and a little bit of rain and sun and finally after 2,000 years you get a tree with a diameter of 10 meters and a height of 120 meters and a mass of uh, hundreds or thousands of tons and it looks beautiful coming out of this little tiny seed. Here we have the tiny seed and we get such a beautiful picture. That's mathematics. Um, yes, and maybe I could motivate you a little bit to, uh, to play with this. Do some exercises um, and I mean there are the semester uh, vacations in summer, two months time to play with this. Uh, it doesn't cost much money, you just need your computer. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I thank you for attending the lectures. I thank you for working hard on the exercises, if you did so. <laughs> and of course, I wish fun with mathematics, with the exercises and maybe with uh, some other things. And of course, I wish you all the best for the exam. I, I mean, that's the, the biggest success for me if you all pass the exam. Uh, I would be really happy um, and of course also because I wouldn't have to correct your exams again next semester. <laughs> um, but it's a matter of really uh, of diving into the mathematics and working hard on it and you, you, you will have fun with it. Thank you very much.